So, uh, a little while ago, there was a phrase that uh, sort of caught the media eye for a while. Um, the phrase was, the art of the deal. Does anybody remember the art of the deal? Um, our next speaker is uh, Nelson Matthew Scalbania. Uh, he was featured prominently in a number of books and articles written by the great chronicler of the Canadian elite, Peter Newman. And uh, his business career is so astonishing that I had to kind of bring his CV out with me because I just, I couldn't remember it all. But just to give you a little kind of cross-section of it, under real estate, 1967 to the present, he says, or the, the CV says, active in real estate primarily in the U.S. and Canada. During a 10-year period from 71 to 81, the volume was over $500 million a year average each year. So this is a single guy who, in this one category of real estate, did over 1,500 transactions in one decade. I have no idea how that's possible. And looking through the rest of it, uh, it's pretty obvious that there is not a business that Nelson Scalbadia has not owned, made, and lost a lot of money in. <laughs> <laughs> um, just let me give you a taste of this. Um, sawmills, breweries, art galleries, theme parks, motorcycles, a mineral company, a renewal energy and water research and development company, a plastics company. In the service industry, he's owned seven different restaurants, nine different hotels, a long distance telephone marketing company. He's even made a full-length feature film. I bet you lost a buck or two on that, Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nelson Scalvania, what an energy. I said I'd never get myself into this position again. A few years ago, I was on a panel of uh, six people giving a roast to a well-known guy. The a guy in the podium I followed was Bob Hope. <laughs> no one heard a word I said. And I feel like I've just followed 25 Bob Hopes. <laughs> uh, life is what happens when you're too busy making other plans. Good evening. Generally speaking, I know a little bit about a lot of things, but not a lot about one thing. In the same way, I play every sport so-so, but I don't play one sport exceptionally well. So what is it I can chat about for 20 minutes to keep your attention? If there was a unique feature of, of my career, it's I didn't have one. I had several. I was never afraid to tackle any size business in any part of the world uh, of any size. So after 40 years of a hectic business career, coupled with a parallel personal adventure, it was suggested I should chat about some of my, some of my personal lows, personal highs, some business highs, some business lows, uh, some lessons learned, and uh, where I am today. One thing I have is a, a, a knack I can kind of hide behind my finger, I mean, meaning I, I only remember the good things. I quickly forget the bad things. Uh, why I do so many businesses, I guess I like the excitement, the variety, the education. And they're all supposedly profit motivated, otherwise you're, doing, you're, not, you're not right. Uh, but let's, let's kind of get on to a few of the things that I've done. I suppose I've done too many things. And by the way, I'm a cheater, you see. Now, it, there's a difference between being absent-minded and Alzheimer's. Absent-minded is you don't know where you put the telephone. Uh, Alzheimer's is when you do get the telephone, you don't know what to do with it. <laughs> I haven't, got, haven't quite got there yet. Um, some of the things I've done are just quickly, just a couple. I was in Atlanta. There's a very large complex called the Omni. Two office towers, big hotel Omni, circling a covered um, ice skating rink with a lot of retail. 
cost day on developments $150 million to build this. I show up, look at this big thing. It's 75% empty. I do a deal to buy this thing for $52 million. I put up $50,000 down. Trouble is, I got to close in 30 days. But the day I, 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 I remove my subjects, I go downstairs, and in the bar there's, called Bugatti's, there's a guy there called uh, Ted Turner sitting there with his girlfriend. And earlier in the day, I'd passed his TV studios, which is in an old, man old colonial mansion down the street. So I go up to him and introduce myself and say, you know, you should move your studios and put them into that skating rink, and every day the news will advertise your building. And he said, see me in the morning. So sure enough, I show up in the morning. He's sitting there with his cowboy boots on that desk with a huge spittoon that he, that he used often, flanked by a lawyer and a, an accountant. And he starts off this way, what's your net worth? And I said, well, why is that relevant? He says, well, mine's a billion. And I like to deal with people at this level. I don't like to bring people up, up here. So anyway, we did end up doing the deal, and it w was relatively successful. I got my money back at least. And then I kind of, I thought the brewery business was a fun business. I don't know why, but I thought it was a fun business. So in northern BC in Prince George, there was a shutdown brewery, Prince George Breweries. I renovated it modernizing it, and then I was going to have a ribbon-cutting ribbon cutting ceremony. And earlier in the month, I'd signed a young 17-year-old kid to, to a personal services contract to play uh, hockey. Wayne Gretzky's first job as a professional hockey player at 17 years old, he cut the ribbon on a brewery in Prince George when he couldn't drink the beer. <laughs> but the beer business has puzzled me. You go to a store in most parts of the world, there's there is water, beer, wine, and Coke. The water costs more than the beer, the wine, and the Coke. Here they spend millions of dollars to color the water, but their first thing costs more than all the other stuff. I always kind of wondered about that. <laughs> now, kind of bear with me here. I, I'm going to have a, this, I think, I, as an engineer, all people's lives can be put in graph form. We kind of think that we all started the same way, but we have, some of us have kick-started. We all end up the way, same way, so kind of just bear with me. That's the graph of my life. <laughs> now, the, this positive and negative, we barely see the negative. Negative is easy to say. Negative is you're either dead or wished you were. <laughs> the positive is kind of the accumulation of everything. You know, it's your health, your family's health, your friend's health, both mental and physical. You have a bunch of material assets, a lot of toys, and you're happy, you're satisfied, all kinds of things happen. So you kind of crawl up as you, there's where I hate to tell you how old I am so you can see where I start off. And I kind of get up to the top. You see, I use that word boundary. You know, there's a peak. As you, you know, no matter how much money you make, no matter, you can only wear one suit and eat so much, and then you get old, you get bald, you get fat, you get prostate cancer, your friends die, your family dies. So I don't care what happens, as you get old age creeps in, so there's a boundary of your, what I call contentment, everything that throws in. Now, right at the very peak, you kind of see a, where I, I'm about 38, 39 years old. Father was a carpenter. When he died, he still never spoke English or read English. But I kind of accumulated a bunch of toys. And I probably wanted all these things because I wanted them when I was young. So when I wasn't bald and just had a prostate cancer, I guess. So I, I, you know, at my peak, I had six homes in various parts of the world, six cars of which four were Rolls and three were convertibles, long range jet, uh, 180 foot yacht in the better train with a full time crew of 13, a lot of art, t 10 different sports teams, part or all of them. And how did I pay for these things? I kind of bought things and sold them, because all those things you can't get a bank loan on. So you had to make money somehow. So I, they tell me I created that word flip. Well, I bought buildings and resold them for more so I could buy things that banks wouldn't give you any money on. Now, I don't know why flip became such a derogatory term. The guy speaking after me, Von Medell, makes wine for a dollar, and he flips it for two dollars. Now. That's not bad, because he makes wine and sells, but it was always bad in, in, my, in my situation. Now, just a couple of the bad things. Sorry about the bad things, get over them. In 1982 or so, Bank Prime was 
24%, believe it or not. I, had, I just got divorced. Uh, I, had the, I had the jet, the boats, the land, uh, six teams, five of which were losing money. So try to service that with no buyers. And that, what, was, what was even worse, there are no buyers in the world. They disappeared. So when I had my first check bounce at 43, that was, ugh, that was awful. After the next 50 bounce, I got kind of used to it. <laughs> anyway, I didn't declare bankruptcy, but I restructured. Restructured means chapter, chapter 11, you kind of pay down the roads kind of thing. So that was a bad time for me. A few years go by, in about 92, 93, I got fingerprinted and I had a mug shot done of me on some ugly venture. That wasn't so much fun. So that's the second kind of big downer of mine that I want to mention at the time, and I won't go any further than that. <laughs> I'd, rather, I'd rather deal about the highs. I kind of, I, I went to Caltech. It has to be my first big high, I think. Had a scholarship to California Institute of Technology, which is, has to be the best school in the world. The ratio is one, one, one. One undergrad, one postgrad, one professor. It was a great school, and I got a master's in, uh, in structural engineering, but in seismic engineering. So I came to Vancouver, and founded an engineering company, which became very large. And we did one out of three buildings in Vancouver. And at that, then at the big peak, the culmination of that engineering career was the BC government had a worldwide competition to build Canada's biggest building, 50-story tower called the Bennett Building after the premier. I, we, I won that competition and spent the next two years designing this 50-story building. Then the government changed. NDP government came. They're not going to build a 50-story monument to the, to the last premier. So they bought the block next door, fired all the consultants, and laid that 50-story building on its side. So you're now in downtown Vancouver, you'll see a two-block long 50-story building that's the courthouse and everything else. So that was kind of my second high. Uh, in that time frame, I bought uh, half a million, half a billion dollars worth of real estate from a company called GenStar. Hotels, apartments, office buildings from New York to uh, Vancouver, and did kind of well with it. Uh, then I was getting engaged. I, I remarried, and I married a, a Greek gal. And I was taken off from Vancouver, and I pick up the newspaper, and, and I saw the uh, Atlanta Flames were in some trouble and for sale. So when I landed in Athens, I called my young daughter, and I said, I, I knew one thing about the sports business. The best way to make money in the sports business is move a franchise to a pregnant city, a city that hasn't got that team. So I had my young daughter, Rosanda, take a check for a million dollars, uncertified, and she flew down to Atlanta, and, and I said, try and buy it for 16 million. She calls me back in, in, um, uh, in Athens, and she's, Dad, he accepted. Oh, Jesus, now I gotta run home, cover the check, first of all, and then I had 30 days to pay the balance of the dollars. The end result of that was, I ended up owning 51% of the team for a total investment of minus $1 million, so that was kind of one of my, one of my fun deals. But you know, in the, in the audience, when they start talking, I just kind of, a bunch of deals remembered. Phil Nugent was here. I, did a, I had a submarine company. I was building a submarines for the Russians way back. <laughs> Phil was my first consultant. And then the CIA showed up one day and said, you shouldn't be doing that, so we had a fold. <laughs> then, then, then the next speaker was a guy, was an astronaut. After the Challenger went down, some NASA guys came to me, engineers came to me and said, look, we got to start building rockets because nobody's sending these commercial satellites up. So I go down to Titusville, which is just out of Fort Lauderdale or out of um, Cape Canaveral, and we start designing to build rockets. And all of a sudden, we needed a lot of intellectual property rights from NASA, at which time the CIA, CIA showed up again. And they said, you're a Canadian. No foreigners are allowed to be part of a company that's having this stuff. So I started a company called E Prime Aerospace, but then went on my way. But let me, let me just finish with a couple of, let me finish with a couple of kind of, I call them exotic deals. In mid-73, I had done a, an engineering job with a fellow in Santiago, Chile, who calls me up in the middle of the summer and says, God, come down with some US dollars in your shoes. Because at that time, Allende was the, Allende was the uh, uh, dictator, and there was total chaos in the country. There was a curfew. 
The military was just rampant, stealing whatever they could steal. It was a terrible time. So he said, come down, you can buy things. So I made three trips. I made three trips in the summer of 73. And I, he took me around to bank managers' homes. And we bought, I bought paintings. I took them off the walls and gave them some dollars. And many of the paintings had on the back of the wall, the back of the painting, national treasure, cannot leave country. There were Monet's, Picasso's, Von Roosdale's, that kind of stuff. I got 25 of them. And the <laughs> earthquake happened, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, on September 10th, I don't know what, I, I go down to the customs, and I have to do what's necessary to the customs guy to get him on the plane. So I put half on Braniff, half on Canadian Pacific, and left the 10th of September 73. You know, the date's well known to me because on September the 11th, Allende was assassinated. Anyway, all the paintings showed up, so I somehow thought, like, these paintings are here. Now, he was just assassinated, and I left the country the day before. Maybe there's a connection there. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> after, four months, after four months with the paintings, I went to Christie's, Sotheby's, and all those places. 20, 23 of the 25 paintings were fake. I sold one to cover up all of my good ones to cover all my costs, and I have the rest to this day. But... You know, there are many kinds of fakes. Fakes that are, when Rembrandt painted a painting 350 years ago and sold it for 50 bucks, the guy across the street would paint one for five bucks and sell it. So where did all these old, suspicious paintings end up? Four months by boat to Santiago and four months to come back, so it's very difficult to authenticate things. So I think that's why they kind of end up down there. Uh, there's too many others, anyway. Um, <laughs> Now, where am I now today? Uh, I, in, in the basket of things that I have now, I'm doing an 8,000 um, acre Four Seasons Resort. There's Whistler, Garibaldi, Vancouver. So we're doing a, a resort development that's half the size of Whistler, but 30 miles closer to Vancouver on the same road. When a private, or when a part-time home in Whistler costs twice as much as your full-time home in the best area of Vancouver, you know there's a market out there. So that's kind of one of the things I'm doing. But the one I've been on now for the last five years, I started a company in Los Alamos, New Mexico. It's called Solar Energy Limited. I took two teams of scientists from the lab down there, which is, if you don't know Los Alamos, it's a managed by the University of California for the Department of Energy, and it's like a 15,000 member think tank that they did the A-bomb and the rest of that stuff there. And I took two teams of scientists, and they've been working on the, the concept was alternative energies that are not only environmentally friendly, but commercially viable. So I'm only going to mention two of the very unique things that they've now done and that we now want to commercialize. Using only solar energy, we take CO2, carbon dioxide, from the atmosphere and make commercial gasoline and commercial electricity. So when you think about it, while we're reducing global warming, we're making clean gasoline and green electricity. So the pilot, first pilot plant was built down there. It's called solar reduction of, of CO2, if you want to know the technical term. The second one that they've done is the world's number one problem is not terrorism, it's not AIDS, it's not SARS, it's water. But it's not just any water. It's water that's not only clean enough to drink, but cheap enough to be used for agricultural purposes. The JFK said, 1961, anybody that can figure out a way to get cheap water from seawater, every other scientific achievement will pale in comparison. So we now think we can make and build a prototype, make fresh water at less than 50 cents a thousand gallons, meaning it's now cheap enough to drink and water your, your goats and to water your, your tomatoes. Uh, now, where some of the lessons learned. Some of the lessons learned. Uh, I'll mention only three. Uh, the first one, I guess, <laughs> first one, there's too many now, I try to pick out which three. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you go into a project, putting up half the money is worse than putting up no money you aggravate a lot less people. It'll, it'll take a while to, for that to sink in, and probably the parallel to that is uh, do a lot more quality deals than quantity deals. Uh, another one is stash something away 
that people can't touch. So, eat. so for an emergency, <coughs> the emergencies are divorce, blackmail, uh, stupid mistakes, downturn in economy, and health hiccups. All of those happened to me. But I wasn't too smart enough to stash anything away. Now, uh, there's a guy called Warren Buffett out there. He's, he uses, I like his term, he, say, he uses the term moat. He says, put a moat, M-O-A-T, put a moat around an acid or two. Uh, what is another one here? I know there's another one here that I better mention because it's... Oh yeah, this one I should mention. It's, it's Jimmy Patterson's secret, but I, I found out too late. <laughs> Don't sell good things to pay for bad things. Everything should sink and swim on its own. Just two quick examples. I had the flames, and I sold the flames for eight, maybe, maybe $8 million to pay off the Boomers, which is a North American Soccer League team I had in Calgary. Now, I should let the Boomers go and kept this asset because it's now worth $200 million. Instead, I sold the flames. That wasn't so smart. I used to own the down, uh, with my wife, we owned the Georgia Hotel in downtown Vancouver. <coughs> paid $13 million for it, sold it for $32 million. Why? Because I had to. I took my half and paid off the Montreal Alouettes. That was very smart. I should have let them go. <laughs> and even then, that wasn't enough. Uh, my wife took her half and owns to this day a lovely hotel in Vancouver called the Wedgwood Hotel. So if you go to Vancouver, go and see the Wedgwood Hotel. Uh, probably in finishing, I should finish the way I started. Life is what happens when you're too busy making other plans and old age comes at a bad time. 